is uh, okay, is called tardigrades, bears of the moss. That's because tardigrades are pretty much found in moss and lichen. And I just wanted to say at the very beginning that I did not create this uh, entire presentation. I've added a few slides to it, but my mentor is Dr. William Miller, and he's currently at Baker University in Kansas, and he taught me everything about tardigrades. So um, like many of you, I'm an amateur. I didn't study um, professionally. I did not become a professor or a scientist. Um, when my kids were in uh, middle school, they became interested in doing some science fair projects. And uh, one of the things we did was we looked under the microscope and discovered tardigrades. So I went out to see Dr. Miller and he basically told me the basics, what I needed to do to find tardigrades, to identify them. And just like you, um, I was an amateur, just fascinated with science and history. And I began researching and collecting tardigrades, which I'll get into a little more in a minute. So let me tell you a little bit about tardigrades. And this again is um, Dr. Miller's presentation for the most part. Um, and it's, it covers all the basics. So let's get started. So what is a tardigrade? Um, we know it's a microscopic animal and it's aquatic. And what does that mean? Basically, it really needs water. The tardigrade lives and thrives in water. It might crawl out on uh, the surface of a leaf or some moss, but it's going to be wet at all times because if the tardigrade dries out, that's called desiccation, and it goes into what we call cryptobiosis. It protects itself. So the aquatic environment is is you know, when it rains, you know, uh, when the environment dries slowly. Now, how big are tardigrades? Most of the tardigrades are between a half a millimeter and one millimeter. It's kind of like the size of a period um, on a typed paper, um, very small. So you, you might be able to see a tardigrade with the naked eye, but you wouldn't know it's a tardigrade. But if you got out a magnifying glass, just a very strong, magnifying less, you might be able to see that, hmm, there's a little critter crawling around. You really do need a microscope, but even an inexpensive low power microscope would be just fine to see a, a tardigrade moving around with his um, little legs. So that's how big they are. Most of the tardigrades that I've seen uh, have been around one millimeter, which is quite big, really. So how were tardigrades discovered? Um, in 1773, um, a German zoologist, Johann August Ephraim Goes, was looking through the microscope, and this is what he saw. Now, back then, of course, we didn't have uh, photography, and we have some really beautiful um, drawings that have uh, survived from the early days of science. And what we're looking at here is one such drawing, very detailed and very accurate. Um, and this is how a tardigrade looked, uh, would have looked to um, Johann Goes at that time. Now, these tardigrades have also been referred to as moss piglets because of their little uh, bodies, the little round bodies. They kind of look a little like a pig, um, and they have that little snout and the cute little eyes. But they live in moss and in lichen. So here are some little... Um, facts, little known facts, you might have heard some of these, but uh, the tardigrade has five body segments. There are separate sexes. The tardigrade lays eggs and four pairs of legs, that's eight. So if you think about uh, animals and insects that have different numbers of legs, um, it's interesting because humans, we have two legs. We have all of our furry uh, four-legged friends. Um, and then you think, oh, okay, that's, let's say two, uh, three, four, five, a starfish has five, right? Um, and spiders have eight legs. So that's sort of close to the tardigrade. Uh, six legs it are, is very common for insects. So 
um, the the eight legs is a little bit rare, and in a minute we'll get to um, the lineage of tardigrades, where they come from, and you'll see how the number of legs is is a very distinct feature. Tardigrades have a nervous system. They don't have eyes, but um, you've seen these two little dots that look like eyes, and those are just basically light sensitive spots. So if we look at a tardigrade under the microscope, we'll actually see it moving towards the light or away from the light, but we definitely know um, that those uh, light sensitive spots function as um, eyes do for us. Uh, they have full digestive uh, systems. They have a complex mouth and pharynx system. That's that throat part. And you could see it in this picture, but we'll get to some more detailed pictures in a second. And well-developed muscles, but with all of that functionality and all of those systems, they do not have a respiratory or circulatory system, meaning no lungs, um, no, no blood circulation, no veins. So they have a very unique way of re uh, respiration, which we'll get into in a sec. So let's look at where tardigrades fall, um, you know, on the chart. You see on the far left fungi and on the far right plants and animals in the middle. So uh, tardigrades sort of fall on that line of arthropods, okay? And they're not vertebrates, but you could see how they might be related to the spider. And because they move around um, like a worm, we, we kind of believe they might have come from the flatworm or roundworm lineage. And then, of course, if we go back, we can see sponges and amoeba, etc. So this is where they fall on the chart. It's a nice visual uh, picture of where tardigrades are in relation to uh, uh, other animal life and plant life. Here we go into a little bit more detail because tardigrades have things in common with arthropods and they also have things in common with nematodes and the worms. So insects like ticks and mites, you know, they have the, the number of, same number of legs as a spider. They have the respiratory system. Oh, they don't have a respiratory system. Um, they have a, a nervous system, which is ladder like and crossed muscles and chewing mouth parts. Uh, well, they don't chew, they suck. And we're going to see in the next slide, you'll see how they puncture their prey and they suck the juices out of the prey. That's, how, that's what they do to, to eat. So here we see, um, a nice detail of what the tardigrade anatomy looks like. Now, if you look under a microscope when you see a tardigrade, even under low power, like if you're using a microscope and you're you're doing, let's just say, uh, 40 times magnification, which isn't a lot, um, even 100 times magnification, a little more, you will see all of these features. So you can actually see um, you can really see the, the front end on the left, the stylet. A stylet is like a little puncturing apparatus. And that little puncturing apparatus goes through the mouth and it punctures, let's say, a piece of plant life or a small um, plant or animal organism and then sucks out the juice in the sucking pharynx, which is in the middle there, right below um, in the center of the head. There's the eye spot and what you might call a brain which is part of that nervous system. If you follow the gray area, you'll see those various lumps that are going down. Um, oh, let me move my cursor. I don't know if you can see this, but you have these spots here of the nervous system. And then their digestive system is in the middle. And then the eggs, the female has this sac-like ovary with eggs in it. So that's pretty much what the um, anatomy looks like. You notice um, the claws, I think that's a pretty important feature because by looking at the claws, that is how we can distinguish the various species. That's the main thing. So some claws um, are very long, some claws are short, and there are various combinations. And 
if you're looking under the microscope, by looking at the claws, you can almost tell what the species is in many cases. So let's talk about um, tardigrade life stages. And this is where this um, phenomenon of uh, cryptobiosis comes into, in, into play. I'm gonna explain it to you right now. In the middle, we see the active tardigrade. They, they eat, they grow, they move, and they reproduce. But in case there is a lack of oxygen, they will, um, reduce, they will reduce in size and, and sort of shrink, okay, as a reaction. And they, um, they tighten up into a little ball. And you see on the far right, uh, that tardigrade is all tightened, tightened up on the lower right and then the lower left. And, and they have the same reaction to a loss of water. It's a protective reaction called um, cryptobiosis. And that's a general term, which includes anoxibiosis, encystment, where they, where they um, turn into a little cyst. If you look in the upper right there, you could see they just basically cover themselves with a, a, a layer or a coating, sort of like a shell. Uh, that's called encystment or a cyst. And then um, on the bottom, when they get into a small um, little ball, that's called a ton. And they do that in anhydrobiosis, which is lack of water or a reaction to too much salt or salinity. Uh, that's called osmobiosis. And, the, and they have the same reaction to freezing. So this is how they go into that protective shell. And we'll show you some detailed pictures of what that looks like. But this is basically how they react. The general term is cryptobiosis, meaning to fall asleep or death, but they're not dead. And they, they turn into a little ball, but they react, you know, in basically uh, five or six different ways here. So the yeah, cryptobiosis is the lack of life. So we, we talked about des desiccation when the environment dries, the animal shrivels into a ton and waits for moisture to return. So what we've found is that um, tardigrades have these different types of cryptobiosis, which we saw in the previous slide, which can be brought on by low temperatures, loss of water, salinity, etc. Um, and their metabolism slows down and just waits until there is sufficient moisture or war it's warm enough or um, it's not as uh, there's not as much salinity. And tardigrades can do this many times. So when I would find a, an old piece of moss or lichen that's dried out, um, I could let that piece of moss sit for weeks and then rehydrate it and suddenly find tardigrades living and thriving in that moss. Um, and that's, that's, that's the kind of mystery of this cryptobiosis, how amazing it is to see. And it's basically stress. It's the tardigrades way of handling stress. Now, these are some of the um, extremes that we're going to talk about here, um, because, you, you, you know, when we talk about temperature um, and, and um, lack of oxygen and how long do they live, quote unquote, this chart shows us that. So 272, well, 273 roughly degrees Celsius minus 272 is what tardigrades can survive in. And they'll go into that little ton stage. And then when they defrost, they come out. They found tardigrades in Antarctica. Um, you know, so wherever scientists go, there's often uh, a tardigradeologist who will ask, hey, can you do me a little favor and scrape up some moss or lichen and send it back to me? Or if they have microscopes, take a look and see if you can find any tardigrades. Um, because at in any environment, uh, in all environments, we found tardigrades. So they've been exposed to, um, you know, months of, of low temperatures and high temperatures too, plus 100 degree, 120 degrees Celsius above boiling. So the same thing, um, tardigrades will survive. Atmospheric pressure, which would be under the ocean, a thousand atmospheres. 
which is 27,000 PSI. They've survived that. And then what we call a pure vacuum, and that's when tardigrades, we sent them up into space and exposed them to space. And then when we brought them back down, they were able to be revived. That's that pure vacuum. And of course, excessive concentrations uh, of nitrogen, carbon dioxide, um, and, and other chemical uh, exposure. And when we say they live over 125 years, that's that doesn't necessarily mean one tardigrade really lives that long. But in the process of the tardigrade going into cryptobiosis, in and out over a long period of time, we're including the time that that tardigrade has been quote unquote asleep and not active. So they found moss that's you know over 100 years old in a museum somewhere and some tardigrade all just says, hey, let me look in that piece of moss which we've, do we've documented to be 125 years old and sure enough, they found tardigrades. So um, the nice thing about space travel, we've sent tardigrades up into space a few times now, um, and it gives us a chance to really observe uh, what, if any, effects space travel has on them, be it cold, heat, uh, time, vacuum, pressure, all of it. So it's a great place for, you know, they're small, they're lightweight. Uh, you know, you can easily do experiments with them in space, and we've done quite a few. Um, it's sort of a, a fun speculation, and it raises interesting questions about how did these capabilities develop? And, you know, the question always arises, hmm, maybe tardigrades came from space or across space. Maybe that was the first life to populate Earth. It, you know, maybe there were tardigrades inside some, some meteorite. Now that's pretty much been um, debunked um, because we have DNA analysis now, and we can see that we can we've done DNA analysis on tardigrades, and we can see how the DNA is related to other life on Earth. But um, it is interesting to to think that they could have traveled, you know, across space and survived that distance. So. Um, there's a it's a strange phenomena because we know that the cryptobiosis um, is kind of weird because water mo molecules are required for metabolism and water expands so you know we've you know since um i don't know i guess the 1940s 1950s science fiction we talked about freezing people and uh cryogenics um, and defrosting people at a later date. But the problem always comes down to when a human being is frozen, all the water molecules expand and you really can't defrost, you know, a person. It would be like, um, it's the equivalent of, you know, ground beef really. So how is it, because molecular expansion ruptures cells. So how is it that tardigrades can do it? Um, and there's a secret involved because what they do is they substitute another substance for the water in their cells. It's sort of a sugar, it's called trehalose. And that substitution is like an antifreeze chemical, which um, helps the tardigrade survive without the water in their uh, molecules. Now let's just talk a, a little bit about uh, tardigrade classification, okay? So, um, we have the two types of tardigrades, basically, in the class of heterotardigrade and eutardigrades. Um, the ones that we typically find in our backyard, uh, the ones that you most likely will encounter will be eutardigrades, and you can see them pictured on the right. You, you will occasionally find these heterotardigrades, and you'll know it immediately if you do spot one because of their scaly uh, armor plates on their bodies. Um, and you can see them on the left. And then you have these ones in the middle called mesotardigrada, uh, which I guess they survive heat. I'm not sure. I've never seen one of those in person, in, live in the microscope. Um, I've seen the ones on the right, the eutardigrades. And the most common, if you were to look in a microscope, will be this Milnesia 
um, which is a very big tardigrade. It's about a millimeter long, very easy to spot. Um, and uh, there's a little booklet if anybody's interested and wants to get out a microscope at some point. Um, I have it on my website available for download, but I'll be happy to send it to anybody here who's interested. Uh, it's a booklet on tardigrade identification with lots of pictures. Uh, that booklet is from Dr. Miller, who did this uh, slideshow as well, and it's really, really nicely illustrated. So just let me know if you're interested in that. And it shows the different types of tardigrades, like you can see on this chart, and how to identify their claws, etc. And another important way to identify tardigrades, um, very obvious way, is by their mouth parts. Uh, we're calling it here buccal apparatus. But really, it's basically the mouth, the throat, and kind of the diaphragm area in the tardigrade. What you're seeing here in this picture on the left and on the right, it's very obvious when you look at a tardigrade under the microscope, these shapes, you can really see it. And if you look down, you can see you can see the mouth parts, which they call the mele here, and the mouth shape, um, the buccal tube, and those stylets. Those are for piercing food. They poke through the mouth and they puncture food. It's like um, sort of like muscles uh, at the corners. They're like little elbows that bend those arms. And then the micro and macro placoids. Those little dots in the middle of um, that section, the oval section at the bottom, they're very distinct. And you can see in the microscope, you can count them and you'll immediately know um, pretty much what type of tardigrade you're looking at. Now, the, these are the claws that we we're talking about before. And you can really see um, on a particular tardigrade, you'll see 2112, they call it. Um, and that's um, two of the long claws, one of the little claws, and two of the little baby claws. Um, and it's very distinct. It's an accessory spine that hangs off the edge of the claw. There's the primary branch. And then there are little uh, odd shaped claws. Look at the one on the right, 2121 two, one types of claws. Um, really distinct and you'll see those if you look at tardigrades under the microscope and even when you look at tardigrade pictures a lot of times there are articles that you'll read or you'll you'll come across and they show a picture of a tardigrade take a look at the claws on whatever tardigrade you see in a picture and immediately you'll start to see how distinct they are on that particular tardigrade they have little tiny spurs look at the one on the lower left there's a super tiny little spur at the very bottom of that claw and that's enough to identify a different species so that gives you an idea of how we how we look at and identify tardigrades now these are pretty much um the tardigrades uh in the u tardigrade class but look at look at these here um these are two other types with those plates i told you about the armored plates you can identify those tardigrades by their plates tiny little things like little bumps, little whiskers, little things coming out of the plates. Those tell us all about what type of tardigrade it is. So I'm just showing you these, these pictures. They're detailed, maybe a little bit boring um, because you're, you know, you're not studying them necessarily, but I think it's important for you to know how these tardigrades are identified when they discover a new species. The spines and spikes and filaments sticking out that form the plates. That's how scientists, tardigradeologists, um, that's what they use to make their decisions, their determinations. Um, and then there are even patterns on these plates that they look at. Spines, patterns, and plate detail. But you need a more powerful microscope for that. Not very powerful, still within the range of an amateur. You can buy one on Amazon. You, you need about 200 to 400 magnification. And translation, when you're buying a microscope, they usually give you four objectives with it. Four objective lenses and you get an eyepiece. Your eyepiece is like 10 power and your objective lenses um, would be four, four, 20, uh, and 40, and, and 100. So the four power objective times 10 is 40 power. But if you have a 
10 power objective and you multiply that by the eyepiece 10 it's 100 power you're in business you're really seeing a lot of the tardigrade in terms of identification and if you have a 40 power objective which is very common in an amateur microscope uh, you will get 400 power and easily see these plates and these details that's why i'm showing you this they also have different colors orange and green so you can't miss that either now the fun part tardy grade eggs this is a really um, important um, and easy way to uh, disti distinguish different tardy grades these are the surfaces of the eggs so um, i've been looking at a tardy grade under a microscope ah, i'm not really sure what it is but i see next to it two or three eggs so i just look at the egg and I say, oh, that is a macrobiotis. I wasn't sure if it was a macrobiotis or a minibiotis. You know, they look very the same. They look very much the same, but one is just a little bit tinier. The difference between 10 microns and 15 microns. Heck, you know, that's really hard to figure out under the microscope. But when you see eggs lying nearby and you can see these types of eggs with the little star-shaped tops, you say to yourself, oh, yeah, that probably is macrobiotis. So eggs are really helpful in identifying uh, tardigrades. And of course, um, I've actually seen eggs uh, in the shed skin. So a tardigrade will shed its skin with live eggs in it. And the shed skin looks like a tardigrade, but there's nothing inside but eggs. And then if you watch those eggs under the microscope, they will hatch. Uh, if you're lucky, you'll actually see them hatch. But if you come back in an hour or two or three hours, you might see some little tardigrades moving around in the eggs. So where do tardigrades live? We're just going to talk about the habitats first. They're, you find them in moss because it's wet. Very often it's damp. Lichen. So lichen might be dry on a tree, it might appear dry, but it might actually be moist underneath. But certainly after a rainfall, lichen remains wet for a long time and all the tardigrades come out and feed, okay? Soil, it's hard to find tardigrades in soil because soil, um, if you look at soil under the microscope, it's very messy and it's hard to distinguish what's in it. And the pieces and the chunks are huge. So it's a lot easier to see a tardigrade crawling around on a piece of lichen or moss than uh, among some fragments of debris of soil. Leaf litter, very common. So, you know, when you clean your gutters uh, or you find some leaf litter, you can actually um, take a little bit of it, of that water and look at it under the microscope. You'll be surprised you can find tardigrades. Beach sand. I've tried to find tardigrades in beach sand and I have not been successful. Um, and marine sediment and freshwater algae. And where? All continents. So these habitats we've just described, they, those habitats are all over the world. So, you know, not only in moss and lichen, but many other environments. And um, the, the marine tardigrades, you know, in, in the ocean and in the beach are not, not that well studied. They're, they're very little studied and they're harder to collect and separate. So we don't know a lot about those. So anybody, I mean, if you're in Maryland and you want to do a tardigrade study um, in the bay, um, that would be great. You'd be, you know, it'd be a great study because there's very little known um, about them. And again, all continents, they've been found in Antarctica, uh, they've been found in Africa, Australia, everywhere, most types of soil, uh, high altitude, um, bottom of the ocean. So uh, if, you, if you're interested in tardigrades, wherever you are, they're in your backyard. Now, how do tardigrades move around? Um, you know, there's a lot of speculation. And the belief is, um, that they're carried on wind, okay, and, and maybe pieces of dust, maybe on, on anim, uh, birds' legs uh, or birds' wings, uh, migrating birds, um, maybe some of the dirt caked on the legs or trapped in the feathers. We don't know, but that's what we believe, maybe in their di digestive tract. Um, it, it, it's hard to know. Um, floating plants, uh, we believe they're carried around on the winds, though. 
Now, we were talking about tardy grade research opportunities. We'll quickly touch on that. Um, ecology, habitat, and distribution. So that's a good research uh, opportunity. If you're, uh, you like natural history and you're doing an ecology or habitat study, you could include tardigrades in that study somehow. Uh, evolution and phylogenetic positioning. Well, you, you, yes, that's a good research opportunity, but you do need heavy duty equipment, um, you know, for doing um, DNA analysis. Population dynamics and associations. That's a broader study. You'd probably have to do that with uh, in conjunction with with other scientists in, in neighboring states. Taxonomy and speciation. Uh, we talked a lot about that earlier, um, where you would look at look for new species, or maybe you'd find a new species and see where they fit on the chart. Uh, uh, zoo geography, zoogeography. Um, that's pretty much the same. Uh, in terms of biodiversity, where these tardigrades are found, and of course, DNA studies. So these are opportunities. Um, let's quickly talk about where tardigrades are mapped in the US. And you can see there are various studies that have been done by different universities mainly, um, but there's plenty of room, plenty of opportunity to do a tardigrade study. And when I first met Dr. Miller at Baker University, what what clued me in was I looked at this map and there were no tardigrades in New Jersey at the time and I lived in New Jersey and I said what no tardigrades in New Jersey so I decided then and there to do a, a population survey of tardigrades in New Jersey and um, I went uh, to every county which I'll get into in a second but here in Kansas for example here's a population study uh, that was done in, in um, conjunction with Dr. Miller, um, and basically uh, he was able to find tardigrades and document them throughout Kansas, where he's located. And the map that you're looking at on the far left where it says USA, if you look closely at New Jersey, you'll see it says zero, because at the time that was the map that I looked at. And so I decided to do a population study in New Jersey and um, I looked at all the counties in New Jersey uh, systematically. And fortunately for me, I was in sales and my territory was a state in New Jersey. So wherever I made sales calls, I would take tardy great uh, uh, specimens from lichen, from trees, from moss, wherever I went in New Jersey. And I numbered each one of my site collection uh, locations, and you can see that on this map here, and that's a picture of one of the tardigrades and a little tardigrade baby that just came out of an egg, and that's a tardigrade egg below in that picture. So I did the population study in New Jersey. Now, take a look at the numbers on the map. Those numbers, I was able to correlate on a spreadsheet during my collection um, and put it all in a spreadsheet with my collection date, the site number latitude and longitude, which I just used the GPS for that. Uh, I did the elevation, I had an altimeter, you know, and all this stuff is now on your phone. Uh, back when I was doing this in 2003, 2001, we didn't have smartphones, but you do now. So you could easily do this kind of thing in Maryland. You could do it, you know, wherever you live. Um, and then I put the location name, okay, like where was I? the county, because I did all the counties in New Jersey, and then the tardigrade types, if I discovered any, and you could see down in the middle there on 31, uh, Ramazodius and Milnesium, I found those two types. And then on 30, in number 34, um, site number seven, uh, I found Macrobiotis and Ramazodius. So I was able to identify them and how many attempts I made at uh, dehydrating, what type of sample it was, lichen or moss. Sometimes I found tardigrades in bark, just plain old a piece of bark from a tree. And then I, I got into tree identification and, you, you know, using books on tree identification. And I would also document the type of tree or whether I found it on dirt or moss, and then whether or not I prepared a permanent slide of the tardigrade. So, Hunting tardigrades. 
I, I hope I've sparked your enthusiasm for wanting to do this. Um, so you can find it, find them on fence posts, trees, especially the lichen and, and the, the moss that grows on trees. Very, very e easy to find tardigrades there. Rocks totally loaded with moss and algae and lichen uh, and loaded with tardigrades. And these are the best places and leaf litter. So that's where you'd want to look. And a quick, here's just a quick overview. And I have a course on how to find tardigrades, which was mentioned earlier. Um, and uh, this is basically um, what, what the course is about. So I'll give you a quick overview. You take your sample from the moss or the lichen, okay? You document in a dry paper bag your sample. You put your sample in a, in a paper bag. You don't want to put it in a plastic bag because it could get moldy, okay? And you document the spe specimen number, where you found it, etc. And then when you get a chance, you soak it in water for 24 hours, even sometimes four or five hours. And then you separate a tiny, tiny little bit of that moss into a Petri dish um, because it's huge under a microscope. And then you, you look at it and you will find tardigrades there. You may not find them right away, but eventually you will. And then if you wanna make a permanent slide, um, you know, the, the, the technique is here on the bottom. You store it in alcohol or formalin, and, and, and then you, you need a special solution of Hoyer's, very difficult to get, and then you can make a permanent slide. But that's the process in a nutshell of how it's done. And then here are some tardigrade references at the end. Um, there's, there, there are very few books on identifying tardigrades. Um, but this one at the top is a pamphlet called Bears of the Moss by Miller, which I have and I've scanned it as a PDF. So I'll be happy to send it to you. And um, I'm now, you know, open to open to taking questions. I'm going to stop the sharing the screen share and um, I'm open to questions. And uh, if anybody does want to take the course, uh, I have a discount code which I will put in the chat as well. So you can get it for basically half price, 995, I think is half the price. And that code is good, uh, good for five days or something like that. So if anybody's interested, and even if, you know, you go beyond there, if you send me an email, I'd be glad to send you a discount code at any time. If you're inter you know, if this uh, is of interest to you. So please. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Mike, so much. This was great. And, 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 and I think that if it wasn't nighttime, everybody would be out looking, hunting right now because they're so excited to get out there. And start. So luckily we're at night, so they have, uh, we have a lot of questions here. Okay, um, great, great. So, <clears throat> Lawrence asks, <clears throat> how many eggs do tardigrades mostly lay? Um, there's no definitive number, but you could see... Uh, you could see them scattered about on the bottom of a Petri dish, glowing like little jewels, um, maybe five or six, if you're lucky. Sometimes you'll see them in this abandoned husk or um, molted uh, shell of a tardigrade, and there would be four or five in there. Sometimes you'll only see one or two scattered around, so not a lot. Well, and that goes, I'm just forward because Wendy also had a question about eggs. When they lay their eggs, they're attached are the tardigrade skin until the eggs hatch. Yes. So you know you know what molting is? Molting is when uh, like a snake sheds its skin. Okay, we know about that. Tardigrades actually outgrow their skin and climb out of it. They molt. They shed this husk and it, it really is like a husk, like a like a pistachio nut shell. It's not as hard, but it's like that. So they crawl out of this shell, um, and the shell looks identical with the legs and the claws and everything. It looks like a tardigrade, but it's hollow. And inside is this little sack of eggs, and it stays in there. And then the tardigrades hatch and burst out of that shell. Fascinating. Or, or tardigrades will lay them loose and you'll find them on the floor of the Petri dish. Okay. K 
Kate, um, Katie asks, do they play a role, in, since you find them in moss and lichen, do they play a role in the life cycles of moss and our lichen? I don't think so, not to our knowledge. I haven't read any articles that say that. Um, it's a great question in terms of, um, you know, all life is interconnected, you know, and we find out, you know, in more and more ways. I mean, we've recently found out that fungi connects all trees, you know, in certain forests, you know, and there's a communication system. May, some of some some of the people here may have heard of of this vast communications network through fungi. So we're always finding out about these interconnection interconnectivity. Perhaps tardigrades do play a role in moss and lichen. <clears throat> I, and and um... They eat the moss and lichen, is that correct? Yes, and they eat other plant life and they eat bacteria and small microorganisms and plant, little plant cells. You know, if you look under, if you take some pond water, you know, and you've let it ferment or sit for a while, um, you'll find a whole bunch of little green organisms in it. That's tardigrade food. So all of those little things which you might see in pond water, those little uh, organisms, plant and animal organisms, are also present and climbing around on the moss and the lichen, even though you typically wouldn't see it because the moss and the lichen are green and it's a thin layer. But that's the same stuff they're eating. Uh, Wendy asks, do the tardigrades live in groups or in, uh, are they territorial? Very recently, an article was written. It might even be on my website. I, what I post on my website are blog articles that are, you know, of interest and not too over the top scientific, um, but understandable. So um, I recently read an article that says, yes, they are territorial. So that's one part of your question. And the other part is, are they, do they hang out in groups? No, not so much. They seem to be solo animals and we thought they were antisocial, but um, they are observing that they are a little bit social, but they definitely don't, I, you don't find them in groups. Um, <clears throat> now, there's a question I'm not, I'm not sure I understand it. If tardigrades can live in almost any weather, what type of group are they? And I'm not sure I understand this. this well, although they quote unquote live in any type of weather, they might be dehydrated or desiccated. So we might say, oh, they can live in the desert. Well, I don't call that living if you're curled up into a little ball, you know, for 20 years waiting for a rain rainfall. So the word survive comes to mind in any type of weather. They thrive in wet, moist environments, but they survive in any type of uh, climate. Okay. Um, and what eats a tardigrade? Uh, bigger animals, probably. I would say you and I do probably. <laughs> I wouldn't be surprised. And then, you know, I can't guarantee it, but I wouldn't be surprised as if, if you have a salad and it's not washed and don't get, you know, fanatic and paranoid here, but it's possible you could eat a tardigrade, just like you could eat, you know, a piece of soil if you're having rice, you know, even though you wash the rice. So I think other animals eat them, but they're not necessarily hunted as prey for other animals, but certainly larger organisms. Um, and tardigrades have been found to eat each other on occasion. So anything, anything that's hungry, and can eat a one millimeter critter might eat a tardigrade. So you're the only tardigrade hunter out there. Uh, no, there are plenty of them. I just, I, I've been called the space bear hunter because of that video, first animal to survive in space. If you Google that and look at it on YouTube, you know, you'll see me in it, I'm wearing this shirt. Um, basically, so I got the nickname tardigrade hunter or space bear hunter. But um, there are many, many tardigradeologists, and if anybody wants a link to the, na uh, to the International Registry of Tardigradeologists all over the world, uh, if you have questions about different countries, they're all available to answer. Um, and so that kind of goes on to what Katie asked, can tardigrades live on people or in people? 
No, no, not at all. They live on plants that are wet and moist, uh, light like lichen and moss, and they live in moist environments. They don't live on us. You know, they, there has been, you know, the um, the myth of, uh, you know, oh, you have little you have little mites in your eyelashes and all that. No, no, you know, no, tardigrades don't live on us. They're not on your body. They're not like fleas or ticks or anything, body lice. No, no, no. There are no tardigrades here. Um, if you engage in normal hygiene, you're not going to have dirt on you. Therefore, you're not going to have tardigrades on you. If you walk around barefoot in the garden and you come in and your feet are dirty, hey, you might be tracking tardigrades into your house, but as soon as you take a shower, um, they're down the drain. <laughs> now, uh, Lewis asked, when Israel included tardigrades in their lunar lander, what is the risk of contaminating the moon? Well, the answer is yes, I know about this. Boom, the lunar lander crashed. They had a bunch of tardigrades on it. Um, the tardigrades are probably still there on the moon. They're all in um, cryptobiosis for sure, or dead. But look, the word contamination is a very a good word, choice of words there because contamination means different things to different people. So um, there's really no life on the moon that we know of, and there's not a heck of a lot going on, and they're not really any danger to anything on the moon that's living. So I wouldn't really call that contamination in that sense, but in the purest sense of the word, sure, anything we send up to the moon is contamination. If you just send a, um, an empty lunar lander there, uh, you know, that takes some pictures and there's no life on it at all, haven't you really contaminated the moon with a, you know, with a piece of technology? We've contaminated space surrounding the earth with satellites, you know, you could call that contamination of space. So contamination is a broad word, but um, yeah, it's not a good idea. I know where the questioner is coming from. It's not a good idea to send life forms up to other uh, celestial bodies um, without really thinking it through, without intention. And that's what happened. Okay. Now, Nancy says that, um, and you mentioned in your talk that there are male and female uh, tardigrades. And so do they, how do the eggs get fertilized? The eggs get fertilized. Uh, okay. Um, we know very little about the, um, the reproductive habits of tardigrades. Uh, we do know th that eggs get fertilized uh, when they're rolling around um, loose um, and they are fertilized by some sort of sexual interaction between tardigrades, but uh, we don't have any, uh, we don't have any X-rated movies of that at this point in time. Another good research project for somebody. Absolutely. Um, and so Karen asks, have you ever seen tardigrades eating other microscopic organisms or see other microorganisms eating them or their eggs, like watch them actually eat? Uh, yes, I've seen tardigrades latch onto a piece of vegetation and um, by the mouth, the sucking motion. Very hard to see much more than that for me. Um, I have also seen pieces of vegetation inside tardigrade stomachs, which is very easy to see. A lot of greenery in there. Darn, I didn't see the tardigrade eat that, but I see a bunch of greenery in there. So I've come close, but that's not to say you couldn't, you know, with a microscope, see it yourself. Luck, it's, there's a little luck involved and persistence in observation. It's open to, open to, to it. It's not hard to see. Um, Wendy asks, are their claws used for anything? Do they use them to pull themselves around or to dig? Oh, absolutely used for everything. Annoyingly so. So I want to get a nice picture of a tardigrade, right? 
But no, he's holding on to this piece of lichen for dear life, and he's crawling around it like a ball. And he's just loving it. He's playing on this ball of lichen. And I want to get a picture of him, and I can't. And as soon as I get ready, and you know with a microscope, you're busy focusing and ready to snap your picture at the same time. It's not easy. And the second you want to take the picture, he's crawled to the other side, and it's impossible to get him loose from that. You, you, you could take a tiny little needle and try to pry him loose, but you can't really do it. So tardigrades use these claws to get around and to move around everywhere. You really have to be lucky to find a tardigrade that is not using his or her claws to get around, to claw something. <clears throat> um, I have a question, and, sure. and continue, continue to ask questions, and if you also want to raise your hand, I can call on you to ask a question uh, directly to Mike. Um, you mentioned that they can survive up to 200 and, like 273 degrees, negative 273 degrees centigrade. Well, where on earth is it negative 273 degrees centigrade? Oh, that's the laboratory for sure. That's or um, yeah, that's the laboratory. But uh, you know, it's pretty cold in space, and it's pretty cold under the ocean. But that's the laboratory. That's liquid nitrogen. Somebody's taking some liquid nitrogen and saying, "Hey, let's throw a couple of tardigrades in and see what happens." So they really are just trying to find the most extreme situations and then they stick a tardigrade in and every time they do it, the tardigrade survives, it seems. So right. Like, where, right. How right. do you kill a tardigrade, Mike? How do you kill them? Right. It's the, uh, it's testing the limits. Actually, I think Museum of Natural History in New York had an exhibit, Tardigrades Life at the Limits. Um, you know, trying to test the limits. And for good reason, because not for good reason, but for a reason. Um, they want to see uh, if there's something we can learn in terms of our own survival. And have they um, made any connections on in terms of the tardigrades and how the, uh, their survival techniques can be utilized by us? There have been some papers written on um, can the gene that they have or the technique that they have for cryptobiosis help us traverse long distances in space and go into some sort of suspended animation but there's been very little um very little practical practically practical information that's come out we've also looked at um you know better ways like during covid we were looking at you know the problem with the covid vaccine was that you had to keep it refrigerated in order to distribute it it was a it was a little bit of a challenge to do that and then of course the pharmacist had to you made an appointment the pharmacist would defrost it so the tardigrades were studied could we use their cryptobiotic um chemicals uh what they do to help um these vaccines um, be distributed without having to be refrigerated. So that was looked into. A lot of experiments were done in order to um, improve the way we we stored and distributed vaccines, but nothing really practical came out of it at this point. Do you have any tips or tricks of when you're looking at a, looking at a sample underneath the microscope and you're trying to take a picture based on all of your years of experience that you can pass along to us? Yes, I have one major tip or, or thing that you can do right away. First of all, you don't need to have a, pe a Petri dish or Petri dish. You can use a little plastic cup that you get from Arby's where they have the sauce that you put in it. You know, those, those little white or clear, better, little tiny clear cups. You can just use a little cup to put a little water and a little moss in it. Okay, so that's the first thing. You don't really need... Uh, special equipment. And the second thing is, if you want to see a tardigrade, you know, you can also use, um, I'm looking around here on my desk, you can use a lid, a little plastic lid from a blister pack. This has metal on it, but pretend the whole thing is plastic. You know, a little plastic lid that's clear uh, or cut it out of um, a packaging. And then you put some water on the bottom. And the key is, the important point is, 
If you look at it under the microscope lit from the bottom, it's hard to see tardigrades. You have to light it from the top. So you can mount a little flashlight or some sort of um, desk lamp and put the beam going sideways across like this and put a black piece of construction paper underneath. So if you have a piece of black construction paper underneath and you light it from the top, tardigrades and tardigrade eggs will sparkle and shine on that black background. So I did see some questions like somebody asked, um, what instrument do I play? Because my music stand is in the back. I play flute. So I've been playing for like 30 years, but I'm about high school level because I started late in life and um, a lot of self-taught, a lot of different teachers. So that's the instrument, flute. I'm not very good, but I enjoy it. Uh, let's see some of the other questions. One person said, did I, um, it was Karen asking, uh, did I see them eating other microscopic animals? No, I've never seen it myself. Um, but other scientists have. And I'm not a scientist. I'm, I'm an amateur, just like you. I would consider myself a naturalist or an amateur citizen scientist. And uh, we say we're, not, we are all scientists. Science is just a search for knowledge. It's science is knowledge. And it's not, as long as you're out there looking, most, most, uh, uh, most discoveries are made by just people like you and me out there looking. Right. Historically, that's how it's been. You know, Charles Darwin, you know, Louis Pasteur was a doctor. He had a practice. But he was just fascinated with his discoveries and sharing it, you know. So we're if we love science, which I do, you know, all of this is very interesting. Um, I'm just looking to see. Um, well, Mary, Mary asked, "What got you so interested in tardigrades?" Yeah, just to continue on the story, my kids were in middle school, and we did some science projects with a microscope, and um, we just it was just so much fun for me and. That's often the case. Sometimes the parent goes a little overboard in their kid's project. And um, I just, um, you know, read about tardigrades and then I became fascinated. And when the, when the projects were over, I just continued and, you know, bought better equipment and got interested in it. It's, it's you know, as fascinating to me just as it is, as it is to you. So I'm going to put a link to my well my website I think was linked to if you go to my website my emails on it but I'm just going to give it to you right now if anybody sends me an email um, let's see I want to make sure I typed it correctly and I'm going to send it to everyone that's my email i'll send you the pdf booklet on tardigrade identification if you're interested i also let me also put in the chat right now um my link for uh let's say that in earlier a discount code i want to give you that oh. link link as well hold on There's a coupon code and a link. I'll put that in too. Right. And um, it's the lowest price Udemy that the platform will allow me to put in there. I can't make it lower than they tell me. So that's that's it right there. And my email is at the top. If you have any questions or you want more information or you want the booklet, it's a PDF form. And I'll send you a bunch of extra stuff too, which you could download from my website. Um, but I'll send you a link to some cool tardigrade stuff as well. Hey, Mike, one last question from, uh, from Taryn. Uh, their seven year olds would like to know, can they really, can tardigrades live inside of a volcano? I doubt it. You know, that's that supposition. I'm, I'm going to say no. The supposition was, oh, if they can survive such and such a temperature and a volcano has that temperature, can a tardigrade live in there? I wouldn't, again, I wouldn't call it living. Theoretically, if you could have, have something that wouldn't melt and you could lower a tardigrade into a volcano and then tar take a tardigrade out of the volcano, that tardigrade might revive 
but I wouldn't call that living in a volcano. So I'm going to say no. Okay. On that note, thank you so, oh, there's one more question. Yes, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank yous all around. Um, we look forward to uh, learning more about tardigrades. You've definitely gotten us all excited, and I'm sure everybody will be out there hunting along with you uh, tomorrow. But everyone, thank you so much, Mike. Thank you, Elena, for setting thank this you. up. Thank you. Thank you, Elena. Uh, and, and thank you, Bronwyn. Thank you. And thank you all. Yep. We'll see y'all not next week because that one was canceled, but then in the next week for, uh, I know I've even forgot what it was. Is it the, uh, the evolution of the Appalachian Mountains um, or Bird? No, it's Bird City, Maryland. Come join us next time and stay well, stay curious, stay outside and uh, go find some tardigrades. Take care, everybody. Thank you. Bye. -bye. Thank you. Wonderful. Bye. Thank you. Mike, thanks again.